This is episode 511 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I am very pleased to be joined by returning guest, Vance Ginn. Uh, Vance has done work for a variety of public policy think tanks, including the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and is now an independent consultant who can be reached at Ginn Economic Consulting. That's Ginn with two ends, uh, and uh, it's vanceginn.com for uh, more information uh, about his work. So welcome back to Tipping Point, Vance. Paul, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And I should note it's Vance Ginn, PhD, but we'll we'll just call each other Vance and Paul, and uh, we'll go through it that way. Uh, Vance, uh, yeah, so uh, let's let's get started. Just tell tell us a little bit about yourself. You're uh, coming to us from Austin, Texas, which of course is the state capital of Texas, and you worked for uh, the think tank in Texas there for a while, but you've uh, branched out since uh, I think we last had you on. That's right, Paul. And um, I, I don't claim the People's Republic of Austin. I'm in Round Rock, <laughs> which is about 20 miles north of Austin. And so, uh, but yeah, right right here in the middle of Texas. And I was at the Texas Public Policy Foundation for about a decade working on a lot of issues, the budget, tax reform, uh, spending limits is a big one, poverty relief initiatives, things of that nature. It's kind of my calling. Um, what I do is let people prosper. That's my mantra of what I do. And I host the Let People Prosper show, which is a podcast that people can find on all the major platforms. Um, and I have a Substack newsletter called Let People Prosper as well, vanscan.substack.com. But then I opened up my own thing, again, economic consulting, and um, really been enjoying that. And I, I served for a year as the chief economist for the Office of Management and Budget in the Trump White House. So I had a lot of stories uh, about what all happened there and the different things that was going on. Um, and then I came back to TVPF for, for a couple of years and, and started this again economic consulting. Um, and I'm the chief economist for the Pelican Institute in Louisiana, helping them with some stuff and, and also a senior fellow at Americans for Tax Reform. So I'm really trying to broaden my horizons to make sure that to let people prosper. And a big part of that is the responsible budgeting, tax reform, and trying to get government out of the way, Paul. I know a lot of the stuff that you, you've been working on as well. Yeah. And, uh, state budgets and uh we'll just jump right into that because that's uh, obviously your your wheelhouse and dealing with uh trying to make states uh, a little bit more responsible now uh few states are more fiscally inconsonant than, than the land of enchantments uh, we especially nowadays with our oil and gas revenues uh coming in at remarkable levels we had a 3.6 billion dollar budget surplus which amounted to a 42 percent year over year surplus revenue situation uh, they didn't spend all of it but they spent uh, 1.2 billion of it on top of already bloated state budget um what do you what's your message and how do you try to um you know put some innovative and interesting spins on what's going on with state budgets and how they can be uh, more responsible and ultimately make their state economies better. Yeah, Paul, um, that's pretty fascinating. We're talking about the the surplus they had there. They didn't spend it all. Maybe there was a spending limit that kept them from doing that. Um, but but they're still spending a lot of it, right? The one point two billion, and you see this across the nation. I mean, Texas has a thirty three billion dollar surplus right now, and. They're talking about maybe providing some tax relief of about half of it, but then they're going to spend the rest of the half, right? If it's surplus, that should be excess money that's collected by the government from taxpayers that should go back to the taxpayer at the end of the day. Um, but and so how do you really start to define the narrative when you start getting into billions or hundreds of millions of dollars within these budgets, you lose people, you lose the grassroots, you lose others that are out there. And so one of the things that I really worked on about a decade ago was called the conservative Texas budget, which was really a way to define the narrative about sound budgeting. And it's using sound research that's out there that's been published. It looks at the Colorado's Taxpayer Bill of Rights, Tabor, that's been kind of the gold standard for how to limit government spending over time. And how does it do that? Well, it just takes part of the budget, um, all the state funds, and says, let's limit that growth to no more than population growth plus inflation, which is a reasonable metric for the average taxpayer's ability to pay for government spending. 
There's no free lunch. The government has no money. It all comes out of our pocket, out of the productive private sector. So we want as limited amount of that as possible. And we need to make sure that government is limited in what they're spending. And this is a way to do that. Now, of course, it is a maximum. We would love for it to be less than population growth plus inflation. But at least that's giving you some sort of governor, if you think about it on a car, of how much you can grow by on, on the amount of the, of, of the government. And it also usually grows by population plus inflation grows by less than the economy of GDP, personal income, these other types of metrics. And so the kind of the golden rule here, again, is to look at how do you grow government by less than the economy as a share of the economy is going to be contracting over time by looking at population plus inflation. So we started that in Texas. It has uh, it's, it's done a great job of reining in the growth. Um, the growth rate of the budget has got, has been cut by half. From the five budgets before we put that in place in 2014 to the four that have been thereafter, and the budget has grown by less than population growth plus inflation. Compared to the before that, it was growing well above population growth plus inflation. And this means you have more opportunities for tax relief, for keeping taxes lower than otherwise, and things of that nature. And I think it's really important. Um, and now, Paul, I'm working with um, 12 other state think tanks, one of those being Louisiana, but other ones like Tennessee and Florida and up in Michigan, the Mackinac Center, um, of, of responsible budgeting. And, and now, with Americans for Tax Reform, and we're soon going to come out with what we're calling the responsible budget project, which is going to have a responsible budget for each state based on population growth plus inflation and has a comparison of what the budget looks like over the last decade to if it had followed population inflation. And as you might suspect, Paul, is that most states um, are growing well above population plus inflation across the country, which means that we're paying higher taxes than otherwise. And so when you start to release this in a lot of states, it doesn't work overnight. But it's about redefining the narrative about the budget. Where does that money come from? What are the priorities that are being spent on by state legislators? And if we can start heading in that direction, we're having the right discussion. Because too often it's like, look, we spent X number of dollars last time. Let's increase it by Y. We're good to go. Let's call it a day. That's not how we should be budgeting. That's not how we do it in our family. And that's not how a business does it. And, and since they're taking our money, <laughs> you know, taxation is theft, they're taking it. We need to make sure it's being spent wisely. And so this gives us a step in that direction. Yeah, just to give you the uh, kind of perspective from New Mexico. So uh, 1.2 billion was spent, uh, new money spent, and then there was, uh, you know, a plan to reduce taxes that really fell through. And it's a good question as to what that additional uh, money, what will happen to that. But New Mexico and, you know, I, I'm, you're, you're from Texas. I think they have some permanent funds up there. Uh, I don't know how they work in Texas. And I'm, I know I'm probably catching you a little bit out of left field here, but New Mexico has some of the biggest uh, permanent funds in the, not just the country, but in the world. Uh, I think we've got $44 billion tied up in permanent funds. And, you know, on one hand, the uh, the idea is that that's money that'll be there when oil and gas is no longer useful or somehow we've exhausted all those supplies, which I think it's kind of based on false premises to begin with. But mm. uh, New Mexico, ultimately, uh, we have a lot of spending that's either deferred or not really accountable to the traditional democratic processes and uh, uh, something that we've kind of tried to push the more conservative legislators here in our state to say, look, you know, this is just deferred spending. These, hmm. these permanent funds are not some sacred cow that we should be uh, holding on to. We, we would be better off in a poor state like New Mexico if we use some of that money to uh, cut income taxes or reduce other tax burdens and make New Mexico a business friendly state. Your, your thoughts? Well, Paul, it, what's the forty four billion dollars? Is it just sitting in a fund? Is it used for universities or anything like that? Or uh, yeah, a lot of it is. Uh, some of it's not, but yeah, most of it is is geared towards directly funding uh, those universities and the K twelve school system. Yeah, yeah. So so Texas has those as well. Um, there's a big fund that's used for Texas A&M and University of Texas that's funded by the oil and gas uh, taxes or, or oil and gas mineral rights out there in West Texas, which is interesting because West Texas has Texas Tech University, which is where I went and got a PhD in economics. They actually don't get any of that funding. It was all done, you know, way back in the day when for UT and A&M to fund them. Now UT and A&M have these huge permanent funds, yet they're still ratcheting up tuition. 
uh, you know, if they have these endowments and other funds that are out there, why don't we use those first instead of thinking about raising tuition and ratcheting up everything else and then all of the the other nonsense that they're teaching these days at universities and, um, you know, in, in Texas as well, there's the um, rainy day fund, the economic stabilization fund that's funded by severance taxes from oil and gas, right? And and that's supposed to have about $27 billion in it. Um, I don't remember the permanent fund, how much it's in there right now in Texas, but just for the rainy day fund alone is $27 billion that's sitting there for unforeseen revenue shortfalls. If you have a recession or, um, um, you know, a, a major hurricane comes in or something else, then it can be tapped. But of course, the state legislature has tapped it for many other things, for increasing education spending, for increasing healthcare spending. Um, so they've used it, but it is continuing to grow. And, and, and that goes outside of the spending limit because that is dedicated funds. In, in Texas, we have a constitutional spending limit that is um, – it's the funds that are not dedicated by the Constitution that are included in there, which are about 45 percent of the budget, the total budget, which on a biennial basis is about two hundred and sixty billion dollars. Right. And and so if you think about it from that sense, you're only talking about 45 percent of it. Less than half is actually underneath the spending limit. They did pass a stronger spending limit. They being the Texas legislature in 2021 that it, that included all consolidated general revenue. So general revenue and non dedicated and, and uh, sorry, dedicated general revenue, which is now 55 percent of the budget. And they base that on population growth and inflation. And so the more that they can dedicate funds, this is what they like to do if they, they see the rules of the game. They try to get around the rules of the game, whether it be permanent funds or something else. And to your point, Paul, earlier is that they don't include a lot of the UALs, the um, um, unaccounted for, the, the liabilities that, that grow over, over time on the pension funds. They won't include those a lot of times in the budget. They don't in Texas, and they don't include it in their spending limit either. But when you look at that, these are massive amounts that for teachers or state employees that in just in Texas, I think the, the teacher one is now up to $40 billion in unfunded liabilities, <laughs> meaning you know how much is the flow of funds expected for revenue versus the costs that are going out over time. They use a discount rate. It's usually too high. Um, and then that's where they get the $40 billion. If you look at a more realistic one that Alec has looked at, I think it's closer to 60 to 70 billion. So, so we're, we're, we have some massive problems here with, with that as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, the thing about the accountability is really frustrating because when you have these government uh, institutions that have uh, an automatic, you know, supply of cash coming in and there's really no, um, you know, accountability for that money. Yeah, the, the people, average citizens and politicians alike kind of forget that the, those pots of money even exist. And it's uh, kind of becomes a, a nice little crony setup that uh, it's like a husband or a wife keeping a, a, a little account on the side that they keep quiet. Well, you know that money is not going to be used responsibly and for the benefit of the family. <laughs> They're going to be uh, no. using that for nefarious and, uh, you know, special purposes, so to speak. So it's, it's unfortunate. But um, let's, let's go on to uh, kind of uh, you know, talking about Texas and uh, some specific differences, you know, Texas is kind of the paradigm, uh, arguably right up there with Florida, uh, for the conservative approach to governance. Uh, California is among those that really uh, the left, you know, you could say that they've followed the lefty type policy prescriptions. Uh, New York would be another one. And, uh, you know, some some recent reports, not recent so much, but I, I uncovered them recently and uh, I thought, wow, this is interesting. And Vance is the guy who would probably know this kind of thing um, and be able to talk about it. So, uh, there, there's been some articles in publications like the Houston Chronicle and others that have made the claim that uh, for most people, tax burdens are actually heavier in Houston than they are in uh, in California. That was uh, a surprise to me. And when I contacted you, you said, no, that's uh, some misguided or uh, misuse uh, of the data. So uh, let's let's get into it. Where are the tax burdens heavier and lower, Houston, uh, not Houston, um, Texas or California. Yeah, Paul, I mean, they come out with this every time there's another election. Um, and this was 
right around the time of the the Beto uh, versus Greg Abbott sort of election, and you know they'll 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 release some other information thereafter. But usually it's around those times um, for the media to kind of go towards whoever the Democrat is. And they'll say, look, California um, has a lower burden than in Texas. And they'll pick and choose. They'll cherry pick their data, of course. And there's this there's these one reports or there's there's this one entity that puts out reports um, called ITEP, this economic policy group. And what they usually do is they'll look at the distribution of the tax burden and they'll say, OK, well, Texas has a higher distributional cost on the lower income people, meaning that the tax burden is more regressive. And so therefore the tax burden is higher than it is in California, which has a progressive income tax. Texas, fortunately, I feel like we're blessed to not have an income tax at all. But from this viewpoint of ITEP, which is a left of center group, um, they will look at the distribution of the burden and come up with this idea that Texas is more costly to live in than in California. But whenever you start breaking these numbers down, you know, you find that that's not necessarily the case. And I would argue it's not the case. Um, it is true that California has a progressive income tax. What does that mean? That means as your income goes up, the rates go up as well. There's these brackets that increase as the, your income goes up. And, and that means that it's progressive. Higher income people are going to pay as a share. Their rates are going to be higher. Now, that doesn't mean they're always paying uh, more in taxes because they'll find loopholes and deductions and other things to get around the taxes. And oh, by the way, the upper income people will still pay most of the tax, whether you have a progressive income tax or a flat tax, because they have more income. <laughs> and so they'll still pay a larger share of the, the tax, just like at the federal level, right? The top 1% of income earners pay 40% of all taxes. The top 10% of income earners pay 70% of income taxes. The top 50% of income earners pay 97% of all federal income taxes collected. That's not payroll taxes as well, but that's all the income taxes part. So you can see that you can have a progressive tax. They're still paying a lot of the taxes anyway. Um, a small share of the burden is actually on the lower income folks, which I guess they like. They like that. But we got to remember who are the ones that create the jobs? Who are the ones that make investments in the economy? And it's usually the upper income folks that do that, not the lower income folks who are usually going to be the workers and everything else. And so when you come back to Texas and California, I like to look at some other metrics that are out there, Paul. And I know um, you and I work a lot with the Fraser Institute. They have come out with the Economic Freedom of North America. Their latest report showed that Texas had the fourth, fourth most economically free state in the nation. California was the second worst, 49th, is if you think about it that way. Um, and that's based on government spending burdens, tax burdens, and labor market regulation burdens. Um, Florida was number one. 50, uh, New York was last. But Texas and California are opposed there. If you look at state migration t trends, the most inbound people are moving to Texas, the fourth fourth most in 2022. California ranked 41st. So people want to move to places that have the lower taxes. But let's look at some of the other things. State and local tax burden per capita. Texas is fourth best in the nation um, compared to California. That's 43rd. Um, state and local property tax collection per capita. This is where Texas doesn't do a great job. We rank 40th in Texas versus 37th in California. And, and when you take into account not only these economic or these burden measures, um, like state business tax climate, Texas ranks 13th, California 48th, but that also goes into what happens with the economic factors as well. The unemployment rate is on, is on, on average of the last 20 years lower in Texas at 5.8% compared to 7.4% in Louisiana uh, and in California. Um, employment to population ratio is higher in Texas than in California. Even the top 10% of income shares is, is, is you know, it's right close, 42.6% compared to 42.3%. And finally here, poverty measures. You know, the, the official poverty rate which doesn't account for cost of living differences and things of that nature between each state. Texas at 12.9%, um, California is at 11%, right? So it does rank higher. But when you use the, the supplemental poverty measure, which does account for cost of living differences, especially in housing, Texas at 10.4%, California is the highest in the nation at 13.2%. So I say all of this to go back to this ITEP report. They argue that the share, the, the burden, this distributional chart is more costly in Texas. And, and I just don't think that's the case when you look at spending. Spending is the ultimate burden of government is much higher in California. They rank 47th in state and local spending per capita versus 14th in Texas. And even when you look at those 
overall state and local burdens per capita as well, you've really got a high cost. And a lot of the cost comes at the local level from all the property taxes that are in Texas, which you know I've been working on a long, long time to try to bring those down. But even when you look at state and local governments, Texas as a lower burden than California. And if they didn't, Paul, why are people moving here in droves? Why, why are businesses leaving California and moving to Texas? Texas now has 54 of the Fortune 500 companies, 10%. Uh, they, they can go anywhere in the globe, and 10% of those companies have moved to Texas. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense that California has a, a lower burden, tax burden than, than Texas. Yeah, and I, as you were talking, I looked up the uh, California tax uh, brackets. And I honestly didn't know this information because uh, I don't deal with California tax policy. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I think uh, ITEP probably seems to do is uh, they they claim these mythological people who are, you know, making that uh, 4% tax rate between 20,883 and 32,960. I mean, you you can't live in vast majority of places in California uh, at that level, even as a single individual, uh, without welfare programs and the like. So those are uh, four to eight, six percent tax, uh, uh, you know, tax rates right there. I mean, you're you're paying in California a nine point three percent tax rate as a single individual if you make over fifty seven thousand eight twenty four. I mean, that's wow, barely yep. poverty level when you're talking about California. So it really reinforces your point. But I do want to ask you a little bit, and I uh, you know, I know there is some action right now or talk in Texas about uh, dealing with your property tax burdens because you know you do have no personal income tax, and that's fantastic and definitely a uh, you know, a positive for Texas when it comes to economic growth. But uh, if you talk to people in New Mexico who have done, you know, business or have homes one place or the other, they will definitely say, oh, yeah, Texas property taxes, they will really get you. Uh, what, what's the deal, if you will, with uh, Texas's property taxes? And what's going on with uh, trying to reform them? And I guess your legislative session, is it over for this cycle? Not yet. The Not 31st. Yet. Okay. So there's still potential. Is there going to be possibly something done on property taxes in Texas? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Something will be done. I don't know if it'll be during the regular session. It could take a special session, but Got something it. will be done this year. Um, and, and, you know, you're right, Paul. I mean, there is a lot of discussion about property taxes. I know my property taxes, I, I pay quite a bit. And whenever I see it come out of my escrow, I'm like, oh man, there's more property taxes going on. And um, you know, you have your school district portion, which is about half the property tax in Texas. There's a good discussion in Texas about school choice. Um, there's some there's some disagreement between the House and the Senate right now of what's going to happen at the end of the day. But there will be, I think there will be some sort of school choice passed at some point this year as you have all these other states going on. And, and I should just say, you know, across the country, it's been interesting to watch the school choice revolution that's happening, the tax, the, the, the flat tax revolution that's happening, and what I think is the responsible budgeting uh, revolution that's happening. And, and if you if you look at those things, what they're doing is empowering parents. They're empowering families to have more control over their lives, over their kids and everything else. And I think this is going to be extraordinary. And if you have places like New Mexico, like Texas, that don't do this, you're going to be falling behind really quickly because that's one of the beauties of our system of federalism is this competition that's going on. And there is a lot of competition right now um, where places like California will continue to, will, will, you know, California, New York and other in Illinois, you know, even will will lose out in this process. And so when you come back to property taxes, yes, Texas doesn't have a personal income tax. So that's the first thing they'll throw at us is say, look, you don't have a personal income tax. So of course you have high property taxes, but you got to remember that, this, the Texas Constitution prohibits us from having a personal income tax. It also prohibits us from having a statewide property tax. The, all the property taxes are, at least in theory, local. The school district portion is essentially what I would argue is a statewide property tax. The, the Supreme Court here in Texas has found it unconstitutional a couple of times. They put some Band-Aid upon Band-Aid approach. But it, but at least it, technically, it's 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 a local property tax, but it really is more um, statewide because the the state, the Texas legislature, uses the school finance formulas to fund schools across the state. 
they come up with the X amount of dollars that's going to go out to each student. And then they fill it first with property taxes. And then how much ever is left within that bucket, that's where the state funds it through mostly sales taxes. Um, so it's essentially a statewide property tax. And I say all that because you have school property taxes, you have your INS, which is your debt, but you also have cities, counties, special purpose districts, and then they have their own debt and maintenance and operation, the MO portion. So all this together adds up to about $70 billion of property taxes across the state that, that's being collected. Um, and it's so, yes, we don't have an income tax, but this is all done at the local level. So, really, what it is is excessive spending by local governments. Um, because they have to fund it somehow, they they can't really control sales taxes, and so they'll they'll just raise their property taxes. There have been some limitations that have been put in the that put in place in the past of what's called a rollback rate. Um, in 2019, there were some key reforms that says if a city of of Austin, for example, wants to go above three and a half percent of increase of revenue from existing property taxes, they've got to go out to the voters. The voters actually have to approve that. Um, but they get all the new property taxes that they want, so all new property which Austin is growing by leaps and bounds. We've got about, on average, 1,000 people that are moving to Texas every day. A lot of them are moving to Houston, Austin, and Dallas, right? So you're, you're seeing increase of construction everywhere, valuations, and all of that, they can collect more in taxes that way. Um, property taxes over the last year went up 13.3% no matter if they had these limitations in place or not. Um, but if you look at other states, so we ranked the sixth most burdensome according to the Tax Foundation for homeowners um, across the state for property tax burden. But if you look at places like Florida, they rank 26. Well, they don't have a personal income tax. Why are they at the middle of the pack? Tennessee doesn't have a personal income tax. They rank 36th. Why are they at the bottom of the pack? Well, it's because in Texas, there are these blueberries in a sea of red. So you have more conservative Texas legislature, but you've got all these, you know, progressive localities that are wanting to spend and spend and spend, meaning tax and tax and tax. And it's raising property taxes, not only there, but then people move out of Austin and move up to Round Rock where I'm at. And then that starts to increase the valuations as well. And so you have a shift of the burden all across the state of higher property taxes. And yes, you have some of that in Tennessee and in Florida, um, but, but not to the same level th that you do in Texas. Therefore, we have a much higher burden overall. So this session, they're talking about raising the homestead exemption, which is currently $40,000 for the school portion. Um, they want to raise it. There's one to raise it to $70,000. The latest one is to raise it to $100,000. I'm actually not a fan of homestead exemption increases because it just narrows the tax base. Why are we making winners being the those with a primary residence versus losers being you know, renters and business owners. Um, they're also wanting to compress the school district, which just means reduce rates um, for school districts by 15 cents. I think that's the really the way to do it because then everybody, homeowners, renters, business owners, they all benefit from that. And then they want to lower the appraisal cap for homesteads from 10% today to 5%, so cut it in half, but for all real property. But what that's going to do is just shift the burden around. Um, it's going to mean that that the business owners who have had a 100% increase in their appraisals will be limited by 5%. That's going to be paid for somehow, but these local governments who want to spin, spin, spin. And so they'll just raise their tax rates, which means homeowners and everyone else will pay more in property taxes at the end of the day. I don't think appraisal caps are the way to go. I think the what happened in Prop 13 in California locked people into their homes because they can only grow by 1% per year and it can only be like 1% of their overall market value is how much they're paying in property taxes. So why would you move? You, you don't. Incentives matter and it makes valuations higher than otherwise. So anyway, I think something's going to be done. They, they're, at, they're looking at about $16.3 billion in, in new property tax relief. So it's going to be massive. But I, I want to see what the end of the day, you know, Milton Friedman said, don't judge a policy by its intentions, but by its results. And so I really want to see what the results are going to be at, uh, on this at the end of the day. Very cool. Yeah. Um, should be a interesting thing to watch and, uh, hopefully Texas does the right thing. I, I certainly, uh, expect them to do, uh, better than we do in the state of New Mexico. And that's, uh, just a, a, a sad fact for our state, but, um, we're going to change gears a little bit and, uh, something that you know, we don't talk much about here on the Rio Grande foundation, but certainly makes headlines and, We've talked about personally and privately uh, immigration and the immigration issue. Of course, Texas is uh, in many ways, especially El Paso, that western tip uh, edge of Texas, really a 
epicenter of the immigration issue. And, you know, we haven't talked extensively about solutions because it's a very difficult uh, thing to really solve. But uh, talk a little bit about the broad strokes uh, issue of immigration and how you think um, changes could and should be made that would uh, boost overall economic um, you know, prosperity in, in, in the United States. Yeah, Paul, I mean, it's a it's a major issue. It's one that I see closely here in Texas. Um, got to work on some while I was at the Office of Management and Budget in the Trump White House, and, and I've seen different perspectives on it. Um, I'm a free market economist. I'm a classical liberal. So in general, I think it's a good thing to have more immigration. I think it's important for us as a country to have more immigration um, for you know, jobs that are out there. We've had a shortage for jobs for of, of, for a while. Uh, having more people could help to fill a lot of those a lot of those positions. Um, but I also understand that there are some costs to it, right? Whether it be our welfare system. Although many of the the legals, when they first get here, those who are undocumented, it's difficult for them to get a lot of these programs. But there might be some that they get it. I actually think that's a reason to reform our welfare system <laughs> to make it work requirements, make it more restrictive than to reduce immigration. But maybe there's an argument to do that. Um, there's also an argument of you know the the schools. Right, because whenever they get here, a lot of them will, at least in Texas, um, they'll also be educated in K through 12. And um, some will argue, well, they're not paying, but a lot, actually, a lot of them do pay sales taxes. That's one of the nice things about not having a personal income tax is the undocumented will pay sales taxes when they buy things. Um, they also will pay property taxes through the form of rent. Right, rent still has the property tax that's involved in the amount that you're paying in rent. So they are still paying in taxes in Texas in that sense. Um, but the the amount of people that are flowing in is what's really been kind of concerning to me. Uh, you are seeing a number of people that are coming in across the border, whether they built a border wall, which there is a large part of the Texas-Mexico border that has the wall now, um, but there are coyotes and there are others where there are incentives, right? Incentives matter. <laughs> economic, it all goes back to economics, um, but incentives matter. And so you'll find ways to get around these quote unquote barriers for people to come through. And if I'm thinking about it from an eco economic standpoint um, for immigration, there's been this idea that they take our jobs. And the way that I think about it is supply and demand is that there's not one labor market. If you have one labor market, then supply of immigration, immigrants coming through, these undocumented, they would substitute, they'd be perfect substitutes for everyone else in the labor market, for you, Paul, for me, for everyone. But that's not reality. Uh, they're not going to be able to necessarily take our job, at least not yet, <laughs> the way the systems are in place. What there are, there are there's high skilled, there's mid skilled, there's low skilled, there's a number of different types of skilled labor across the labor market. And so the ones that they're actually competing with are the lower skilled workers, especially the ones that are coming from Central America and Mexico, right? So they're lower skilled, uh, English isn't their first language. And so there's going to be some other sort of barriers that are there. Um, that's who they're really they're competing with. And so you would see an increase in supply uh, in that particular low skilled labor market, which would bring down wages. Um, but at the same time, what do they purchase? A lot of lower skilled workers purchase goods and services from those businesses that have low skilled workers like Walmart, like uh, Dollar General. So they increase demand at the same time the supply is going up. And so you can actually see not much of a drop in those lower wages because of supply and demand within that marketplace. And so I, what I think is, is that there's overblown cost of immigration. And I think if we really focused in on what we need, in my view, Paul, and I love to hear if you have any thoughts is, I think we need something that's that's reforming the visa system. We can control, we could try to control the number of people that are coming in by building border walls and everything else. But unless we reform our visa system to where I think we need more, we need we need to allow more people to come here legally in the process. That's the only way we're going to get control over this situation um, to have a long term solution to the problem because if you just stop the number of people they're going to find other ways and it doesn't do anything with our visa system that we need people to come in not not to mention the unfunded liabilities for social security medicare the the major cost of the federal government we're going to need more people paying into the system as we have an aging population baby boomers you know and everything else that aren't working as much we're going to have fewer taxpayers in the process. And so I'm not, I don't think that it all needs to boil down to that. But I also, last thing I'll say, Paul, and I'd love to get your thoughts is mm -hmm. uh, I'm also about people. I want to let people prosper. People come to America for a better life. 
And I'm concerned that if we are restricting so many people, we're not giving that opportunity anymore. And we're going to lose the dynamism, the innovation that has been the melting pot pot for so long. Um, I think we're going to lose, I, if we haven't already started losing that, if you look at productivity numbers and some of the other factors that are out there, um, I think there's some major cost if we don't get this right um, for immigration. Well, uh, I'll say first and foremost that my organization really doesn't uh, do much on the immigration issue. It's just, uh, you know, we look at it as a federal issue and New Mexico has more than enough problems uh, fundamentally for us to deal with. Philosophically, I, I agree with you. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to chat about it briefly with you. Uh, you know, what's going on on the border is a travesty right now. We need a system in place, you know, uh, there, there are some radical libertarians who say, you know, open borders and, you know, open borders doesn't really even have a, a true definition. You know, Ellis Island had a screening system and had real checks to make sure that people weren't going to be a burden on uh, the taxpayers, that they were not criminals, that they were not uh, going to, you know, kind of do more harm to the country than, uh, than, than they would do well for the country. And, so there, there was a system in place. And, you know, the challenge, of course, nowadays is instead of people coming from Europe, they're coming from uh, right south of the border. And it's a little bit tougher, but there's got to be, uh, a, you know, congressional agreements. And I know that's like a, <laughs> you, you might as well find uh, gold uh, in a glacier than finding congressional agreement. But the idea has to be that there is a system in place that does some screening of people but allows you know a bulk of those folks to come into you know, united states as long as they're going to be productive tax-paying citizens filling those jobs that uh you know we need those workers as you rightly say so it's a yeah. uh, it's a difficult thing um yeah. to get that agreement in washington dc uh you know i know trump is you know was considered a uh, anti-immigration president and certainly some of his rhetoric would lead you to believe that, but also uh, Democrats and the unions mm -hmm. that back them aren't necessarily super excited about uh, increasing the la labor supply for their own kind of selfish interests. So uh, I guess as we uh, wrap up this part of the conversation, uh, you know, talk from your perspective about, you, you know, your time in Washington and the mm -hmm. Trump administration, what, what did, what was the real uh, thrust there? Or was that one of your big disagreements with the president? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of discussion, like I was saying earlier, about immigration trade was another one. Maybe we could have a whole discussion about that sometimes, too, where I'm a free trade guy who's wasn't interested in the uh, tariffs that were being put in place. I think we should be having more free trade agreements with our friends, and that would have put more pressure on China than trying to tax ourselves by imposing tariffs on them that wasn't going to change their views and change anything that they were doing at the end of the day and, and i think that's where i kind of came down on it is i think too often we like to point our fingers at someone else like mexico for immigration or china for trade but that leaves three other fingers that are pointed back at us and when we look at ourselves, we got to make sure that we have the best place to do business, the lowest cost to do business, whether our corporate income tax rates are now at the, the average, kind of the Trump tax cuts. I think that was a big part of it, of bringing it down from 35% corporate tax rate to 21%. But the developed world is continuing to go down. I think the average now is right around 18%. So we're still higher than that. Um, and if we should be taxing corporations at all, which of, of course, at the end of the day is on us. And, and so I had a lot of those types of discussions, you know, and even going into the pandemic, um, you know, I found myself in the situation room and someone, Paul, as you know, it's coming up a uh, pretty low income area, single mom. Um, so my dad had epilepsy and, you know, and, uh, uh, first generation college student um, and things that I used to play in a band, <laughs> a drummer in a band and having the opportunity to to be in the situation room, talking to folks like Larry Kudlow and Kevin Hassett and others about the economy. And, you know, my point continued to be that we cannot shut things down. Um, this is not the situation that we need to do that. And the economic effects, the trade-offs are going to be too high. And that's what I hope to always bring to the table is to talk about the trade-offs. Like we talked about earlier with the budget and taxes, or we talk about regulations, or in this case, shutdowns. We get too focused oftentimes on health, for example, in this case, without looking at the trade-offs of how the health is going to be affected by others or climate change 
What happens if we go too far in one direction? What are all the trade-offs? And I think that's what's so important about economics. That's so what's so important about letting people prosper is that when you do something, you're always giving up something else. And we've got to make sure that we consider those. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can do that, whether whatever administration is going to be in the future. And so I learned a lot while I was there. It was it was it, it was stressful and frustrating at times, but I definitely learned a lot. And um, I'm look forward to whatever's going to be for the future. All right, Vance. Well, we're going to wrap it up there, but um, any last uh, things you'd like to share, get out, maybe your social media uh, profile, et cetera. Yeah, Paul. Well, first, just thank you for all you're doing and for the opportunity to be here today. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I tweet a lot of advanced GIN, V-A-N-C-E-G-I-N-N. Uh, like I said earlier, newsletter at Substack, vancegin.substack.com, or my website, vancegin.com. I'm also doing work, of course, with Pelican Institute in Louisiana and America's Tax Reform um, up in D.C., uh, Grover Norquist and others up there. And um, But I'm always helpful in trying to help with new economic ways of thinking about things to make sure that we let people prosper. All right. And uh, again, vansagain.com, a lot of great information. I was uh, reading through your blog and you've got, I don't know how you find the time to do it all. You uh, have uh, even more robust blog articles than I do. And uh, you've got a lot of other things going on. So thanks for your time today, Vance. And uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks so much, Paul. All right. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. Subscribe to the show at Apple, Stitcher, or tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show. All right.